Mark chapter 14, if you would. Mark chapter 14. We're continuing our uh, journey through the gospel of Mark. This morning, uh, the sermon is entitled, The Will of God, Prayer, and Betrayal in Gethsemane. So Mark 14, we'll begin in verse 26. Before I get there, let me just give you an illustration. There was once a Confederate general named Richard S. Ewell. He looked out across the battlefield during the American Civil War. His troop had just exchanged a furious volley of gunfire with the Union troops, who were dug in about 70 yards away. And as the smoke cleared during the brief lull in the shooting, Ewell saw a Union cavalry officer walking among the soldiers, boldly risking death to rally his troops. Ewell was so impressed by the enemy officer's bravery that he ordered the soldiers not to shoot at the man. After the battle, General Ewell was reprimanded by his commanding officer, General T.J. Stonewall Jackson. Why did you order your soldiers not to shoot the Union officer? Jackson demanded sternly. I admired him, sir, said Ewell. He was a brave officer. Look, if you want to win this war, Ewell, said Jackson, shoot the brave officers. Then the cowards will run away and take their men with them. Now, whether he realized it or not, Jackson was, was pronouncing a prophetic principle, a truth, which we'll read about in our text this morning. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. In the drama of our text this morning, we're going to see that Jesus is perfectly in the will of God, that prayer is his greatest weapon, and that even in the betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, Scripture is being fulfilled. So I invite you to turn to Mark 14. We'll begin in verse 26. And remember in the context now, they have met in the, in the upper room at the Last Supper. Jesus has sent Judas off, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. They have left the upper room. They are going down to the Kidron Valley so that they may go towards the Garden of Gethsemane. They have sung the Hallel Psalms, Psalms of encouragement and Psalms of deliverance. And then Jesus brings them back to reality in verse 26. So let's enter in there. Mark 14, 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. And likewise also said they all. So we have here the will of God being pronounced in, in, in prophecy. God's will for Jesus is that he will be stricken. In fact, Jesus quotes Zechariah 13.7. If you were to go there, it says, Awake, sword, go, strike the shepherd. Even though human hatred and envy through the plotting of Judas and the, the religious leaders, they acted out freely. They exercised human free will to strike the shepherd. But God would still override their decisions to accomplish his will. I don't understand it all, but this too was predetermined by God. And so as Jesus and the eleven trooped down the outer stairway of the upper room and headed through the gloom towards the Garden of Gethsemane, he warns them, he quotes the prophet Zechariah, saying that essentially one and all of them will abandon him. He knew it, he understood it, he would forgive it, and God was still on the throne. He said they all would be offended. That is, they all would fall away. They all would be tripped up and abandon him. Yet he makes a commitment. He says, you know, 
in three days I will uh, see you again in Galilee. Now he makes an appointment. Okay, never before has a statement like this been made. It's, it's, it's quite humorous. You know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to get killed. I'll be put on trial. And uh, after I die, I'll see you in three days up in Galilee. <laughs> Hometown, right? Hometown region. Death was a small matter in that sense. It wasn't going to hold them back from making an appointment to see them and meet with them again. They would forget, but he wouldn't. Such a promise like this was never made in the face of the world where a dead man would keep an appointment with his friends after being dead for three days. Though the sheep would forsake the shepherd, the shepherd would find his sheep. Jesus had already taught that the good shepherd would lay down his life for the sheep. And that was beginning now. He would lay down his life for the sheep. He essentially said, look, you're all going to abandon me, but one of you is going to deny me. So Peter boasts, he brags, the, the other disciples fall in. We're not going to deny you either. We'll even die for you if that's the case. Jesus didn't argue the point. He just knew. He understood. Even though the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And he'll say that in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, he knew so intimately what would happen that he even told Peter specifically, you'll deny me. Before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times this night. But again, Peter's not impressed. You know, he's, he's very confident in the flesh, as they all were. And he makes the, the, the bold statement, though I should die, I will never deny you. And we'll see that he does. And a principle that we can glean from this is this, that we understand our own human sinfulness and weakness. We should understand that it is moment by moment dependence on God that helps us to do his will. Anytime we stand in the strength of our own flesh, we are sure to fail. And even worse, to succeed if we do. As the scripture says, let him that thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So let's move down now to the prayers of Jesus in verse 32 of Mark 14. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tear ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto him, them, Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither was they what to answer him. And he cometh a third time and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. So as Jesus and his disciples again made their way out of Jerusalem into the Garden of Gethsemane, they come to, to an enclosed place. There's a gate. He leaves eight of the disciples at the gate, and he takes three with him. At this time, there were only 11 disciples. And I don't understand the mystery of the Garden of Gethsemane and the agony that Jesus faced. Uh, the mystery of the theological term is the hypostatic union. Here, here Jesus, being 100% God and 100% man, wrestling, spiritual wrestling so much so that his sweat was like blood. And there are scientific reasons for that. But Gethsemane, the name means the oil press. 
It was a place where olives were crushed to produce oil. It is a place where pressure would be enforced, that oil might come out. And here in the Garden of Gethsemane, the agony of Jesus, he is going to feel the pressure of all the sins of the world ever committed. Never before has a situation like this occurred. This is a place which is holy ground. They all knew about this place. The garden was well known to all the disciples, especially the traitor, who had already been sent out from the Last Supper to do what he was going to do, to betray Jesus. Judas had already left the upper room. Satan had entered into him, and the game was afoot. This garden, the whole idea of the garden is interesting. The fate of man seems to be sealed in gardens. In the Garden of Eden, Adam lost the heritage of life and union with God through his sin. But now, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus would reverse that as he is willing to pay for that price. If you remember, Eden and Gethsemane, two gardens around which the the fate of humanity would rest. And if you would compare the two, in Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, Jesus obeyed. In Eden, Adam sinned and hid himself from God. In Gethsemane, Jesus sought to seek the face of God. In Eden, God sought out Adam in his rebellion. In Gethsemane, Jesus, Paul would refer to Jesus as the second Adam, the new Adam. In Gethsemane, Jesus sought God's will and submitted to it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when sin entered, I mean, in the Garden of Eden, when sin entered in, They were cast out, Adam and Eve, and angels were set up to guard guard the entrance with a flaming sword so that the Adam and Eve would not return. In Gethsemane, we saw in the scripture reading that a sword would be sheathed. And Jesus told Peter, look, they that essentially they that live by the sword shall die by the sword. That's not how my kingdom comes, not by force. Not like Islam, not like false Christianity of the Roman Catholicism of ages past. My kingdom doesn't come that way. My kingdom comes by a changed heart and a surrendered will. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane here, we see the prayers of Jesus. And typically Jesus, upbeat, faithful, always wanting to do the will of God. Um, You hardly ever hear him ever complaining or talking about how he would suffer and complain. But here, back in verse 33, it says he began to be sore, amazed, and very heavy. He was getting to be full of distress and anguish, in a sense, because it, this was intense. He knew what was going to face him. The shadow of the cross has now poured out on his soul. So he charges the three, you know, he leaves the eight at the gate, and he charges the three, come, come with me, Terry here, watch. He wasn't asking much, he was just, you know, the human side of Jesus, he longed for the comfort knowing at least he'll have three, four, five, eight, eleven guys, friends who could watch with him as he faced the struggle, the suffering. Remember when he began the ministry, thousands, tens of thousands were cheering. At this point in time, he would have three that are close. At this point in time, one of the 12 that was close has now become a traitor. And he tells the three, sit, watch, pray. And he goes, in the Greek wording there, he goes and falls 
He kept falling. He kept praying. This is the struggle, the spiritual wrestling that was going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. The surging seas of sin and sorrow now were breaking upon his soul, and he is in prayer like nothing he has faced yet. His first prayer here we saw, and he repeats it two other times, that the hour would pass and that the cup would be taken away. The cup is symbolic. It's representative of of taking in. It's experiencing something to its fullest. The cup of God's wrath, the cup of blessing, or whatever it is, that's the idea. He's going to face this. And you ask, what is this cup? If he is so in agony about God taking that cup away. He was feeling the weight of the world upon him. Okay, if you could just think real quickly, what sin is he talking about? The sin of Adam, breaking fellowship with God. The sin of Cain, the first man born, the first to become a murderer. The sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. The sins of Israel, after knowing God's deliverance, forgetting God and worshiping other gods. The sins that have ever been committed, all the heinous acts of men and man's inhumanity to man, all these sins were bearing down on him. Sins that, of, that have been committed and sins of omission, sins that, should, that are sins because it wasn't done. Sin's too terrible to mention. Sin, sin, sin. That was the cup that he was about to drink. The sins of the world in which God would exercise his wrath. And his humanity recoiled from it. He was going to drink the full cup of God's wrath and suffer for the sins of the world. So his soul is feeling crushed. In Luke 24, 44 says, Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood. And he cries out, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So he submits. And again, there will always be a mystery in what's going on here in the, in, in the agony of Gethsemane. But this cup... Some say the cup is the, is the cross. Well, anybody here, I think, would shrink away from a future crucifixion. But many had died that way before. It wasn't the physical means of death that caused him to sweat blood. It was our sin. It was the thought of being made sin, of dying and being accursed of God on the tree. It was the thought of being alone with no eye to pity him. Even his three closest friends would fail him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, that's God the Father, would make him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus was facing suffering for the sins of the world in that cup. So we saw he went away to pray, a stone's cast, as I think Luke would say. He comes back, his three friends are asleep, his close friends, and he doesn't, he doesn't speak directly to all three. He says to Simon Peter, the one who boasted, right, I'll never deny you, I'll even die with you, and he says specifically, Peter, remember, a rock, and then Simon, shifting sand, could you not pray with me for an hour? Watch and Pray. The powers of darkness are enclosing in. They are not prevailing over Jesus, but maybe over Peter, James, and John, his closest friends. Watch and pray. He was telling them to watch and pray, not for him, but for themselves, that they enter not into temptation. And we draw from this what we've already seen, right? It's moment-by-moment dependence on God that helps us to do and fulfill his will. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not literal hands filled with swords and guns and bullets. 
They are spiritual. And he tells them, watch and pray. Because watching sights the enemy. Praying fights the enemy. That's how you're going to do God's will. Watch and pray. That's what Jesus did. And he faced what he had to face here. The old serpent, which made his way in the garden at the first, is, is on his way again in the person of Judas. And Jesus says, listen, I know the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he goes and prays three times. If there is any other way, if this hour can pass, God, all things are possible to you, he says. And the response is the silence of heaven. Again, I don't understand all the implications of the prayer and the agony in Gethsemane. Three times he prayed, and three times there was silence in that regard, because the will of God had already been declared. Remember Paul praying three times? He had a thorn in the flesh. And the, and the physical suffering or whatever suffering that Paul was facing, three times he prayed and three times he was denied. And the answer to Paul was this. My grace is sufficient. And then Paul would respond, look, his grace, you know, when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul's answer was, look, my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus could look forward to God's wrath and anger poured on him, but done by men. He goes a second time in prayer, prays the same thing, third time in prayer. He's getting up, he's falling down, he's struggling, he's wrestling. And the third time he says, look, just, just get your rest, sleep on now. And some time passes. And what do we draw from this? Listen, in our humanity, as we seek to do the will of God, as we seek to be dependent on God, we should discipline ourselves. Discipline ourselves to have regular, daily, dependent prayer. That was the key to victory for Jesus. It's the key to victory for us. If you're not living a life of dependent prayer, you are sinning. You are sinning against God, against God's people, against yourself. Watch and pray, he says. And then he says, it's happening. Look down at Mark 14, verse 43. And immediately, while he spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So here we have the betrayal, the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus and Judas meet. Judas betrays Jesus with what is perhaps what is supposed to be a great term or great um, affection, a kiss. And the Greek is that he, he, he exaggerated the kissing and the hugging and so, so much so that in the darkness, the Roman guards and the temple guards would know exactly who needed to be arrested. Jesus, we learn from John's Gospel, tells Peter, again from John's Gospel, put away your sword. It was Peter, I think, he wasn't trying to get the ear, I don't think. I think he was trying to strike the, strike the person down. He says, put away your sword. They that live by the sword shall perish by the sword. 
And Jesus, in the end, says, look, this has to happen. The scriptures must be fulfilled. This is God's will. Now, as I summarize and close here, let's just remember who's all in control of this whole scene, this whole dramatic scene. He says the scriptures must be fulfilled. In other words, God's will was this, for this to happen. You cannot stop it. And this is, again, against the background of the betrayal. If you study the last week of Jesus, you will see that the, the Passion Week, you'll see that all the events very, um, very coordinated precisely to the detail. Okay? There's a donkey, go get the donkey. I'm going to ride the donkey. The donkey's never been ridden before. There's an upper room. You'll see a man with a pitcher on his head. Follow him. I've arranged for it. The scribes, Pharisees, religious leaders, we're going to kill Jesus. It's just a matter of when. And then Judas gets this idea, I'm going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. They're at the Last Supper, and Jesus, is, Jesus has already taught them about servanthood, washing of the disciples' feet. And he says, and you know, he drops the bomb. Boom, one of you is going to betray me. And they ask, is it I, is it I, is it I? And then one of them leans to him and says, who is it? And then Jesus says, it's the one who I'm going to give this sop and dip my bread with. And then I can imagine the eye-to-eye contact. Judas and Jesus, and Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly. Now, from Judas's point of view, he's got a fish or cut bait. The cat's out of the bag. It's him. And Jesus is under, con- under control of the whole situation. The religious establishment did not want to kill Jesus during the feast day. Jesus forces their hand and tells Judas to go, and he gets killed on the greatest or the highest of the feast days. Jesus is ultimately in control even of his betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he states it very clearly. The scriptures must be fulfilled. So who's giving the orders? Who's in control? Jesus. Who's in command? Jesus. He's in control of his own arrest and even trial. He knew he was fulfilling eternal destiny. The scriptures must be fulfilled. So the crucifixion is not an accident. The crucifixion was the fulfillment of his mission. That's what he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew he was going to do God's will. And so he's abandoned. He's forsaken by the eleven. And then there's an interesting note here at the last part of the text in verse 51 and 52. There's a young man that's following. There's no reason why that text is in there except for this. Okay, now if you can imagine, historical, the researchers say this, that um, the owner of the upper room was John Mark's father and mother. Now if you can imagine John Mark who wrote the Gospel of Peter, according to Peter's preaching and stories and witness. John Mark is at his home, sleeping. It is night. Judas returns with all these soldiers, Roman as well as temple guards, to the upper room. Jesus is not there. John Mark hears all the commotion, and he starts following this mob of army and military and and religious guards. He follows them all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, which researchers believe was owned by Mark's father as well. So I think John Mark puts a little self-portrait into the story. It's him. It was he also that followed, and he also that would abandon Jesus. But if we put this all together here, as I close, remember, this is all according to God's will. Scripture must be fulfilled. Jesus had prayed, and he yielded to the Father's will. He was prepared for God's will for his life. 
He bowed the knee and surrendered the will. He was prepared to do God's will, and the disciples were not. He came to the point where he could say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And that's the same point you are at right now, today. Not my will, but yours be done. As we saw the, the training, the instruction of human nature. Look, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if you acknowledge that about yourself, if you know you are given to sin, so much the more should you watch and pray that you, not, that you enter not into temptation. So do you watch and pray? Do you, act, do you understand the, the, the weakness of your flesh? Do you believe, though, that God is still in control, for he has promised he will perfect that which concerns you? The Apostle Paul would say, he that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will work in you, through you, for you, to give your life meaning, to have you live a life well-pleasing to a heavenly Father. He has a plan and a purpose for your life, but you have to come to the point where you bow the knee and say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And if you've never come to him in faith by repenting of sin and bowing down before Jesus as Lord and Savior and putting your trust in him that he died for you exactly like he prayed for tonight, you know, this cup, this cup was the cup of suffering that he would experience for the sins of mankind. They deserved it, but Jesus would pay the fine by dying on the cross. We deserve it. So are you ready? Are you ready to say, God, not my will, but yours be done? Because if you come in faith, repentance and faith, you will be forgiven. You will be changed. and he'll make your life meaningful forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your love and your grace. May we be as Jesus was, praying, yielding, not our wills, but yours be done. I'm speaking to you now, the audience, or anybody within the sound of my voice, if you're here today and you do not know the relief of forgiveness of sins, if you're here today and you do not know the promise and assurance of heaven, you can know. You can be forgiven. By repentance, that is a change of mind and heart, a turning from sin, and by faith, a trust, a commitment of life to Jesus Christ, believing that he died for you and that he rose again. If that is you today, you can pray this simple prayer. God, forgive me the best that I know how. I will turn from sin as you've told me and put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that is you today, you can confess that sin. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that is you today, and if you've prayed that prayer, raise your hand and say, Pastor, that was me. Please help me. Now to the rest, the second invitation is this. Whatever it is in your life, if it's sin, if it's pride, if it's self-dependence, you can repent of that and receive forgiveness and the grace to overcome as you exercise the discipline of watchfulness and of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the grace that is in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, the new life, the new heart, 
the, the new covenant which you've given unto your people, Lord. Help us as we seek to do your will to live out a life that is well-pleasing to you in your power, with your grace, for your glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right, if you please stand, Brother Steve is going to come and lead us in the doxology.